you're listening to The Uncommon Engineer. I'm your host, Steve McLaughlin, Dean of the College. We're just absolutely pleased as punk to have you with us. Please say a few words. went to the zoo and we measured the urination time of all these different animals. It's a huge ring. We can learn a lot from the animal kingdom, even us engineers. Welcome to another episode of The Uncommon Engineer. I'm Steve McLaughlin, Dean of the Georgia Tech College of Engineering. The Uncommon Engineer is our monthly conversation about the ways Georgia Tech engineers make a difference in our world, in our daily lives, and in ways you might not expect for an engineer. Our guest today is Dr. David Hu from the Woodruff School of Mechanical Engineering. Dr. Hu studies animals, including how they walk, eat, and yes, how they urinate. Welcome to the program, David. Hi, Steve. It's great to be on The Uncommon Engineer. You know, when a lot of people think about mechanical engineers, they think about trains and planes and automobiles and manufacturing and materials. But you study animals. Why is a mechanical engineering uh, studying animals, and how does that apply to uh, mechanical engineering? I'm a mechanical engineer, but I also, in mechanical engineering, I study a field called fluid mechanics, which is the motion of stuff like air and water. Lots of devices are based on this, like ships and airplanes. But, you know, the very first um, role models for us mechanical engineers and fluid mechanicists were um, these things like uh, birds and fish, basically nature's way to move around in fluids. They've been, you know, they've been inspiration for hundreds of years. But recently there's been technologies like high-speed cameras and 3D printing and 3D scanning that we can actually start to really figure out how these animals are doing these amazing things. And then when we look at these animals, we're hoping that we can use the principles that we see to design new kinds of uh, devices. Uh, you've gotten a lot of media coverage for some of your work. A splash, can I say, from a study that you did not so long ago about mammal urination. Can you say a little bit more about that? Why you got started on that and what it is we can learn from it? Well, it all started when I was uh, changing diapers for my son. And uh, I had this, 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 uh, this thing happens when you change uh, boys' diapers that sometimes they'll actually just pee on you. And, yeah, um, no, I, I've been there. Yeah. <laughs> and um, one of the things you notice when you watch babies pee is that they take an awfully long time. At first I thought that he had bladder problems, so when I watched him pee, it took about something like 21 seconds. It takes a really long time. And uh, if, you go to your, if you go to the bathroom and time yourself, it's, it's about the same. And that's just, just very strange. This just started out as a curiosity. I mean, I thought, that this is, I thought maybe my son had kind of some kind of health problem because he weighs 10 times less than me. So I should have 10 times as much urine as he does, but he's yeah, getting I mean, out. His bladder's got to be one quarter or one tenth the size yeah, of your yeah. bladder. Uh, it turns out it's all proportional. So yeah, the yeah. uh, kid's bladder was a tenth, and it was all come, but it was coming out at the same time, and it didn't make any sense. So I recruited some engineers to come try to understand the fluid mechanics of the bladder. And it turns out if you look in the history of this field of urology, there's been a huge amount of like questions of how the bladder works and how actually fluid comes out. There's controversy of why, if it's gravity driven, or you have this special muscle called the bladder, is that pushing it out? And no one really knew. So, and this is a great example of turning to nature too to sort of understand this thing. So, since humans evolved from all sorts of different animals, we actually went to the zoo and we measured the urination time of all these different animals. It's a huge range. Best one to give you an example of is an elephant. So, to measure the urination of an elephant, students have to wake up at 5 a.m. when the elephant <laughs> just gets up because elephants don't listen to anything you say, and then they go and put a huge kitchen garbage can underneath this elephant. Mm -hmm. And they, the elephant fills this garbage can. It's about 20 liters in, in about the same time as my son, about 21 seconds. It's an, so basically all these animals have the same thing in common. I figured there's gotta be some common principle because this is not, it's not normal. And so it turns out if you look into the anatomy, 
what the elephant has and what we all have is this special pipe. My kids and I, we call it the pee-pee pipe, but it's, uh, it's called the urethra. And uh, for an elephant, it's a meter long. Little pe do people know that males and females both have these pee-pee pipes. Uh, for a female elephant, it's a meter long and it's about the width of my fist. What the elephant does and what the rest of these animals do to get urine out is that the wider the pipe, you can imagine it's like a highway. The more la simultaneous lanes cars can go down. So the wider it is, more fluid come can come out. But then the second effect is the fact that this pipe is really tall, and that uses this, uh, this Bernoulli effect, where basically if you've got a long pipe, you can actually focus the, the, the um, forces of gravity so you can get fluid coming out a lot faster. You can notice this if, for example, if you take a, a, I think some students call it beer keg physics. If you take a <laughs> beer keg, if you tap a hole in the middle, it'll flow out way slower than if you tap a hole at the bottom. And that's just an example of, you know, where you put this hole, makes a huge difference in the speed. And that's mm -hmm. basically what the animals have done. They've taken this like really, really thin pipe and infinitesimal amount of fluid, and they use that to accentuate the speed so that even if you've got 20 liters of smell of urine, you can get out at the same speed as um, if you only have like a few ounces. So I started this thing as a curiosity, but um, it was, it just became, it just became a lot of fun. And, uh, uh, and it turned out it actually, a lot of people, a lot of uh, physicians and engineers have actually been starting to use our discovery. There's this Japanese doctor who read about our work, and he was so, this urologist, he interviewed uh, 2,000 Japanese people, all the way up, you know, from kids to adults. And he basically extended our rule, what we call the law of urination, this 21 second rule. And he said, and he found out that just because of natural aging, Basically, if you're 80 years old, you're going to urinate at an average time of 30 seconds instead of 20 seconds. And before this, doctors, when they wanted to measure um, the health of the bladder, they had to use basically lasers or ultrasound. But now, if they want to find out if your bladder muscle is weakening, they can just measure your urination time and show that, oh, your bladder muscles are really weak. Um, I was really happy to see them see this sim use our discoveries to sort of help older patients. There's also the example of they're, make, they're making this, um, they're making these prostheses, basically these um, sort of artificial um, urethras, and uh, they need a, basically a way to test these devices to make sure that they're sort of robust enough to last for a lifetime. And so now they've made it the official protocol for testing urethras is this 21 second rule of urination. They'll make sure that it can urinate for 21 seconds every few hours, and they'll do this test for days and days and days on these, on these products. So. I mean, I was really happy to see that doing something that was fun could actually influence, you know, scientists from the Netherlands all the way to London and all over the world. Let's talk about the frog tongues, um, some of your more recent uh, research. Again, really, really cool stuff. You know, I think as kids, we've seen, you know, frogs using their tongues to grab stuff. What can we learn from a way a frog uses its tongue for engineering? So this frog tongues project started when I was teaching a class biology at the Atlanta Botanical Garden. I was just really interested in how they do it. So the first thing we did was we, um, we took a high-speed camera of a frog, and it's amazingly fast. It can reach out and grab an insect in a 30th of a second. It could fit 10 frog strikes in a single eye blink. And, um, and we would, uh, looked around, and we realized that no one really knew why the tongue could grab something so fast. And it seemed like it would have pretty obvious applications, like if you have these micro air vehicles, if they want to actually pick up a cargo, um, if they want to uh, pick it up before it you know, leaves, they've got to really move fast too. So, so this is a, an example of reverse engineering how the frog tongue works. So uh, I hired this, this um, graduate student named Alexis Noel. Um, she became famous for carrying around a bag of bloody tongues but because one of the very first things that we did was we got tongues from biomedical engineering. One of their dissection classes had these frogs, and we got 20 frogs, and, and we opened their mouths. The frog, it was actually the first time I ever touched a frog tongue. The thing I found out, it's amazingly soft. Turns out it's 10 times softer than the human tongue. It's like 20 times softer than a marshmallow. In fact, the only material out there that's as soft as the frog tongue is basically the human brain. Nature has basically not come up with anything really softer. That's about as soft as it gets. Uh, and then we, um, if you touch the frog tongue, it kind of feels like a sticky chewing gum, but it has this weird sort of sticky coating. And this coating, if you take it off with your fingers and slide it between your fingers, it, it feels really weird. It's um, sort of sticky at first, but then when you slide harder, it gets slippery. So this is a property of materials called non-Newtonian fluids. Um, you might, a typical example of this kind of fluid is like paint. 
So paint was engineered by chemical engineers who wanted a material that you imagine you put paint in a can, you can stir it with your brush, but then when you put it on the walls, it's got to stick. So in other words, frog saliva, just like paint, kind of has like an on-off switch. When you push it really hard, it uh, flows like a liquid, but then um, when you uh, push it softly, it sticks. It just uh, sort of holds, it, holds its grip. And that's exactly how the frog saliva and tongue work. It's got to be really soft and have this special sort of on-off switch in the fluid. So when it reaches out and grabs the prey, it's able to stick. And then when it pulls it back into its mouth, it actually uses these eyeballs that move ultra fast and they push the prey off the tongue. So it's got to have be able to sort of stick to the prey and then uh, make it make sure the prey can come off later. After we did this frog project, I was I was just amazed at how little we knew about how well tongues could grab objects. So I thought the next thing to do was to focus on her childhood hobby, which was for her she just loves cats. She was telling me the story about this cat, uh, Murphy, that um, it really likes to lick things around the house, and one of the things that it licks is this blanket. The funny thing is when it licks this blanket, it gets its tongue stuck in it, and it gets really angry and, and things like that, but it can use to lick this blanket. And then we were talking about this, and I realized that's really strange because the frog tongues are super soft, but these cats, they have actually these spines. I wonder what the heck these things are. So um, she went on this adventure um, around the southeast. Uh, she went to, I don't know if you've heard of Tennessee Tiger Haven. No. <laughs> There's a lot of drug dealers around the country, and they like to raise tigers as pets. But uh, okay. oftentimes these tigers get to, to be the size they'll eat, like 50 pounds of meat a day and things like that. And they'll have to give them up for adoption. All the illegal tigers in the U.S., they go to this place called Tennessee Tiger Haven. We went to this place, and we picked up the tongues of all these different cats, tigers, um, cougars, lions. And we found all of them had the same exact spines as her cat. Not only the same sh uh, shape, the same size, where we actually could use some, started to use some technology. We actually picked up each of the little spines from these different animals, and we put them in a 3D scanner and we 3D scanned them, and then we actually 3D printed them. Because th the tigers are a little bit too dangerous to really study up close, so <laughs> what we wanted to do was we wanted to build a device that was kind of as effective. These cats, it turns out, they're spending something like 20% of their time just grooming themselves. And they've got to do that because they're sort of solitary predators, so they've got to be, comp even after they've killed a prey and gotten themselves coated in gore and blood, they've got to be able to clean themselves completely in order to go um, find their next prey. We 3D printed these little spines and we embedded them in this soft um, silicon matrix. And so in that way, we actually built an artificial cat tongue. And um, we could actually test how, how well this thing could uh, work on basically um, helping to clean fur and, and uh, different f kinds of fabrics. So that's an example where um, we kind of use the ingenuity in nature and then we use current technologies to build something that kind of has these properties and then we can actually help it solve the science as well. We talked about tongues, we talked about urination, and I know one of the things that at least I saw was, um, you know, after the flood in Houston, uh, your work on ants and how ants respond to their anthill being inundated with water or what they do in, in a flood, and you got a lot of publicity around that. Can you tell us a little bit more about your work with ants and how it relates to floods? Have you ever gotten bitten by a fire ant? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, they're a pretty big deal um, all over Georgia, and in fact, they're, they're a species that's invasive the entire half of the United States, and um, they're spreading all over the world. Uh, I was just uh, a, a week ago, I was just talking to a radio station in Korea. They were just freaked out at seeing fire ants show up at their harbor, and they were worried that they were going to end up kind of like the United States. And So why would an engineer want to study fire ants? Fire ants are interesting because they, they can actually survive floods, and that's not typical uh, for an insect. Most insects, uh, there's these insects called water striders, these insects that sort of, they kind of like on the surface of your lakes, they glide, they're really elegant, they move quickly. Um, those are the one of the few exceptions, but most insects that stuck in water, they usually just become food for water striders and they drown. Um, but these fire ants, they're one of the few species that actually can survive flash floods. They're like, there are about 10,000 species of ants in the world, and this one evolved in Brazil in this area called uh, the Pantanal. It's a sort of vast wetland that every single year during the raising season, it floods up to a meter deep. Any animal that had to survive this had to evolve ways to deal with water. And so what the fire ant does, it does, um, it does this amazing thing. It, if you 
and you can actually simulate this. If you have fire ants in your home, you can take a bucket of them and you just drip water into the bucket. And if you do it slowly enough, you don't drown the ants. The ants will actually come out of their underground homes and they'll, what they'll do is link themselves together and they're gonna build this waterproof raft. By linking their bodies together, they can actually trap air pockets and that makes the entire thing really buoyant and uh, that makes, makes it really pretty much seaworthy. And as a result, these sort of dinner plate sized ant rafts, they can float out to the open ocean. They can last for months just by feeding on their sort of offspring. I know that's kind of gross. They're really, really good at um, being waterproof. What we discovered in our lab was that they're not just good at being waterproof, but these rafts, um, they're kind of like a, they're an example of a, I mentioned this earlier, but it's non-Newtonian fluid. They're an example of a material that's both kind of like liquid and solid at the same time. For example, if these rafts sort of strike, uh, you, can, you can take an ant raft and you can squeeze it between your hands and it'll sort of spring back out, kind of like a, kind of like a silly putty. Or you could sort of drop a rock on top of it and instead of, you know, the raft sinking, the rock will actually sink, the individual ants will sort of feel the presence of the rock and they'll move out of the way and reconnect on the other side so that the rock actually kind of penetrates the raft like some terminator kind of material. It's amazing that the ants can do it because they're living things and they do it purely by mechanical connections. So they just basically make and break these connections and they can sort of have these properties that make them really resilient. And so this project was actually funded by the Army Research Office. They were really interested in sort of self-healing materials and if, I mean, ants can sort of give us some kind of idea of um, how to build a really uh, self-healing material just like the ants can. We've talked about uh, the th the kind of work that you've done in the past, and and you have shared you know the work that your students do. Where where are you headed? What are the kinds of uh, what's what's next for you and your group? It's sort of top secret, but uh, since we're on this uncommon engineer show, I guess I guess I'll have to tell you a little bit about it. This is not published yet, and um, but uh, my students actually we entered a competition last year, an international competition in Montreal to build a sniffing machine. To build this device that can distinguish different types of cheese in Montreal. And so that's actually pretty hard. I mean, a human can do it, but uh, how do you build a machine that can distinguish not just, you know, alcohol and water, but different types of like, you know, cheese from Northern Montreal and Southern Montreal, Brie, Camembert. We built this device that um, uses these principles of animals. The, in biology, this has been long-standing sort of question, of why in the world do animals sniff? Like, when, when I have dirty gym socks, I don't take a long whiff. I, I'll do these <laughs> sniffs. And if you look at your dog, they'll do the same thing. And it turns out it's this principle that's been conserved. We've done experiments at the Atlanta Zoo. Elephants also sniff. Why in the world are these animals sniffing? Why does, you know, taking short, you know, periodic uh, breaths, why does that help you sort of distinguish objects better? So we built this device that kind of resembles a bellows. Uh, we call it Gromit. Gromit is this character that went to the moon to figure out it was made out of cheese. That's it, cheese. We'll go somewhere where there's cheese. It, it basically has a bellows that pulls and pushes air uh, around a sensor. And we found out if we basically emulate the animal sniffing rates, basically for a dog that's about um, two to almost eight times per second, we could actually get the sensor to read uh, much more data from the cheese than without. And so with this device and this sort of sniffing mechanism, we were able to actually get third place in this international sniffing competition. That meant we got to eat all the cheese. But I'm really happy about that because I think there's a huge amount of fluid mechanics outside swimming and flying too, like our senses sense of smell really requires on fluid, you know, air as a carrier. And uh, it's really, you know, you can probably imagine it's also like a, a programming problem, like how does your brain distinguish these things, but how do you bring those messages to your brain in the most effective way? And so we're building these devices that kind of look like an elephant's trunk. Elephants apparently have a really, really good sense of smell. They got more nasal sensors, sort of more neurons for smell than any other animal. And no one really knows why. So I really want to understand fluid mechanics of different senses. So I went from basically the, the tongue, and now I'm going to the nose. One of the things that we always do on The Uncommon Engineers, we talk about what got you to thinking about being an engineer. And can you say a little bit about uh, where you grew up and some of your experiences in childhood and how that drew you to uh, becoming an engineer? I've always loved animals. 
I think what I liked about animals is that they're, they're really complicated. I didn't really have a way to study them until I went to college. Actually, before college, I didn't even know what engineering was. But I, I took this class in mechanical engineering because um, I really liked my physics classes. I liked, um, I liked the physics of the everyday world. Um, and that's the first physics class people take, this thing called mechanics, where you learn you know, like about how bridges work and door stops and things like that. And I thought that was interesting. And, um, and, I, and I wanted to learn more about you know, materials and things like that, based about things that you can touch. And um, so I started studying mechanical engineering, and um, I had this undergraduate advisor and I remember that in this office, he had this cover of Nature magazine. It was about uh, intercellular springs. And he basically come up with models for how cells work and how they actually, he used, and I had been studying springs in my engineering class. And I said, wow, that's something that doesn't look at all like a spring, but it sounds like those principles are actually being used to understand like really, really different things. And so I, then I started getting interesting. I thought, hey, I think mechanical engineering would be the right tools that I wouldn't want to use. And I think now I can actually start applying them sort of to my childhood hobby of looking at animals. And now you're a professor. Uh, you work with students and you teach. And so you could have gone off in a different way, you know, as a mechanical engineer. And so what drew you to wanting to be in the classroom or do research or work with students? When I was, so I got my PhD in actually mathematics. My grants are in physics, uh, and I'm a joint professor of biology. So I've had sort of lots of different, you know, sort of invitations to go in different directions. I really think mechanical engineering is still the best place for my kind of work. I mean, all the students that uh, I've worked with in all the projects, these cat tongues, this um, model of urine, and um, this cheese sniffing device, those are actually, they're all built by engineers. And that's the thing about engineering. I think it's sort of a, it's just a, it's a very, very powerful tool. And all I've done is sort of brought a sort of a different, um, you know, a different place for them to apply it. The biologist gives us a huge number of questions that we can answer. And, and we're using a lot of the tools that are just available, you know, made by Georgia Tech and in my department. We've got this thing called the Invention Studio where we can, you know, we, that's where we 3D printed and 3D scanned these cat spikes and these cat tongues, these rheometer devices that are used by chemical engineers. So basically we have all the tools here and I just sort of bring the questions. And I think the two of them together and this, um, this whole engineering mindset, I think is really how it, how it works. Like the, the students I have, they, they want to figure out how things work. Like they're not satisfied until they know exactly how it works. And, understand it, how well it works so much that you can actually build something that can do that process maybe even better or faster. I think our listeners can already get a sense of what makes you an, an uncommon engineer, but, but in your own words, what, what makes you an uncommon engineer? I'm an uncommon engineer because I see engineering in the everyday world. I look at my, my cat, my dog, and I look at these animals and I see all sorts of engineering principles, and uh, I see how amazing they are, and I want to use them to build better devices. We're really lucky to have you at the Georgia Tech community. Keep doing what you're doing because I think it's really, really important for young people to really understand that love of animals can turn into a really, really fascinating career. Thanks so much for, uh, for coming today, David. Thanks a lot, Steve. It's been a pleasure. For now, that's all for The Uncommon Engineer. Be sure to tune in next month when we'll talk to Dr. Jonathan Rogers on how drones are shaping our lives. I'm Steve McLaughlin. Thanks for listening. <laughs>